It's my pleasure to open today's proceedings, the colloquium Aging in Place of Multidisciplinary Perspectives, which is not to say all perspectives. We're going to hear some uh, very important topics today relating to aging in place, but there are other important topics, including financing longevity, affordability of housing, uh, home modifications, uh, the built environment, transportation, uh, community resources. Some of that will be uh, included in a colloquium, a second one we're planning for fall 2019 on Aging in Place, so stay tuned for that. Prior to that, in spring 2019, we'll hold a colloquium on family caregiving, and keynote speaker for that will be Carol Levine of the United Hospital Fund. She's also a member of our, our advisory board, so we're very excited about that. So thank you all for coming, and we have people uh, who are uh, tuning in remotely. Thank, thank you guys out there in the Ethernet. Uh, today's event is being video recorded, and the recording will be posted on our center website. How do I go? There we go. So what is aging in place? A commonly uh, cited definition was developed by the CDC. The ability to live in one's home and community safely, independently, and comfortably, regardless of age, income, or ability levels. And in one way or another, with the possible exception of income, the presentations today will touch upon certain aspects of this definition. Today's event wouldn't be possible with a, a lot of great help from a lot of people, and I just want to acknowledge them. Uh, educational media ser services, Michael Cotter, Juan Castro, and Alex Tavares, who helped with our audiovisual uh, needs and our uh, last minute cries for help. Kelly Phillips of Facilities Management, who helped set everything up so nicely. DRPH and MPH students who rolled up their sleeves to help us. Iman Mirza, Kia Desai, Jeffrey Patrick, and Chris Chakura. Did I hope I pronounced that right? And uh, oh, I want to really thank uh, Jay Bedell, who's the center RA, who uh, is indispensable for making this uh, a successful event. And uh, Cindy Jakubowski, a special thanks to you. Thanks for everything. Uh, we couldn't have done this without her. And also Marianne, uh, Marianne Bruneman. And we had a planning committee to help uh, choose speakers for the event and the topic. Uh, so I'd like to thank Dr. Janet Delac, Luis Perkilme, and uh, Susan Ronan. And last and certainly not, not least, uh, Dean Robert Amler of the School for Health Sciences and Practice, and Dr. Mark Kittleson, who is the chair of the Department of Public Health. Thank you both very much for your continued support of our center activities. And now I'd like to invite Dr. Kittleson uh, uh, up to share a few welcoming words with you. So first of all, before we do that, let's thank everybody who helped contribute to the picked a great day because it's overcast, but it's a good day to be at a conference, so it's not like sunny and shiny and whatever. So, uh, welcome to the program. Uh, I'm Mark Kilson, as Ken mentioned. I'm a relatively new chair. I can say that because it's only been less than a year. Um, but many of you know that prior to January 1st, the public health programs were actually in three units, the Department of Environmental Health Sciences, uh, Department of Epidemiology and Community Health, and the Department of Health Policy and Management. Uh, on January 1st, we realigned and put all of them into one unit, the Department of Public Health, and I'm the chair of that. And it has uh, uh, it's been a great uh, opportunity for me. Uh, this is one of the, probably the best group collectively of people I've worked with. Uh, we're really moving forward, and I think we're really having a, uh, a real impact in the community, continuing to have a, a great impact in the community in health and well-being. Uh, based on my quick study of data, there's like 109 million baby boomers right now, uh, or uh, sorry, people age 50 and above. 
Uh, this includes approximately 76 million baby boomers, which I'm part of. Uh, another 50 million Gen Xers. I love these terms. These are people born from 65 to 79. And I have a daughter in that area. Along with 82 million millennials, which are from 1980 to 1994. Moreover, there are 50, uh, people 50 plus, 50 years of age and older, will continue to grow over the next decade to the tune of 19 million versus a growth of only 6 million for the 18 to 49 population. As a result, we really need to focus on how we deal with this large percentage of those individuals that uh, will need assistance. And I fully understand that young people also need assistance, but we have a huge population growth that we need to address. And my understanding long-term care center is focused to help strategize ways that we can assist these individuals with the challenges that will that they'll be facing in both humane as well as fiscally responsible ways. And programs like this is a good start to, to start reviewing ways that we can address these issues. I think it's also appropriate to mention that the center is, is housed in the School of Health Sciences and Practices and the Department of Public Health. Both have been noted for their ability to reach out to the community um, and the public health, our premises prevention and, and what's better to prevent potential issues and start discussing ways to make this easier. So my congrats to Dr. Knapp for his work along with doctors, uh, Elmer and Locke for their help. Um, and um, I also want to recognize the advisory board committee. And these are incredibly busy people, so we appreciate their uh, their help. Um, Michael Mishak, Dr. Mishak is the uh, chair of physical therapy. Mike, raise your hand there. Dr. Dr. Susan Fox, she's the president and CEO of Westchester. I haven't met this next person, Dr. Melissa Lang. Are you here? There she is. We'll her. She's, the, she's the CEO at is it Gilda's Club, uh, which is an organization that all, uh, works with uh, cancer patients. Correct. It's a nice job. Uh, I haven't met this person either. I hope to soon. Uh, Ms. Carol uh, 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 Levine. Yeah, Carol. Yeah, she can. She can make. Okay. She's the director of the United uh, Hospital Funds Family and Healthcare Project, and Annette. Let me see if I get this right. Shuflin, <laughs> Shufla. <laughs> she's a professor emeritus of or emerita of health policy management at here at NYMC. I haven't met her yet. I've heard nothing but fantastic uh, uh, stories about her. So, thanks for attending. Uh, uh, I'd like to turn off this to Dr. Masek, who's going to be the uh, individual who's going to be talking about the instructor. So, thanks a lot. I'm very pleased to have a small role in today's proceedings. You know, aging and healthy aging is a very complicated domain. I'm very pleased that we have at New York College quite a professional uh, outlook on this, on this issue, uh, along with Dr. Kittleson and his wonderful faculty in the public health programs. You know, Dr. Kate Franklin has got this outstanding program in speech pathology for people with disabilities and they're doing things from screening children and adults. Uh, you'll hear about Dr. Ruffy, they're traveling around the world, you know, bringing in swallowing care, getting uh, communities, which is a wonderful thing. And our program in physical therapy, we have wonderful partners. Uh, Molly Rothman is here today, who's got a group up north of us looking at a fault prevention center. And I think you know, the key is, is collaboration about looking at multiple levels, um, not just the physical considerations, but things like social determinants of health, uh, cultural issues, uh, transportation, and healthy environments. Um, so we're just going to scratch the surface with a couple of topics here today, but I want to say how pleased I am to be able to introduce a number of speakers, start, start chipping away at this whole uh, challenge we have of trying to promote uh, healthy, healthy aging and, and care for people with long-term needs. <coughs> I'm a member of the advisory board of the center, and I'm very happy to work with the group to try to develop the agendas and ongoing programs. 
the, the range of talks today, we have a, a bunch of different things. We're going to start off by talking about elder abuse through a multidisciplinary lens. Elder abuse is becoming you know, very rampant in society. Social stigma-wise, it's underreported. And it's very important to uh, acknowledge the big issue here. And so, uh, Gabriel Locke is going to be talking about uh, signs and symptoms and some legal remedies. We'll then move into a, a trilogy of speakers. Dr. Skoronsky, Lecker, and Philop from Physical Therapy. We'll talk about uh, frailty in the elderly, how we, how we prevent, how we examine, how we evaluate, how we recommend uh, from that standpoint. So another wonderful topic being addressed. We'll then move into nutrition and aging, the issue of keeping the body healthy and, and the effects of aging on nutrition and intake and the effects that way. So uh, Karen Kapinski will be talking about nutrition and meeting the challenges. And then Dr. Rachel Rachelm. Where are you, Luis? <laughs> Rachelm. Rachelm. No, sorry. Luis works the well. Cultural <laughs> we'll come and talk about he's done, he's done work around the world with, with swallowing disorders and he's done in swallowing. He has a wide range of accomplishments in professional organizations. So we have quite a quite a uh, we've got a group of these professionals we need we have and, and some great speakers who kind of open our eyes to different domains. So we'll start with uh, start with uh, Deirdre Locke and just another of you. I have some short bios which we are providing with, which helps us to get to know our, our speakers as they come in. So Deirdre Locke is Assistant Director of General Counsel for the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Center for Elder Justice at the Hebrew Home in Riverdale. She manages the operations of the shelter, including providing legal services to the in the Supreme Court, Housing Court, Family Court. An adjunct professor at Brooklyn Law School, Ms. Locke the Law School's HELP program, helping elders through litigation and policy planning. She's a frequent speaker on the issue of elder abuse in the law and has guest lectured at Penn State Dixon School of Law, Cardozo Law School, Turo Law, Hofstra, and CUNY Law Schools, and training to attorneys to the New York State Judicial Institute, Queens Bar Association, Bronx Bar Association, as a member of the law line, which I'm sure what the law line is. This locks appointed by Mayor Bill de Blasio to the Age Friendly NYC Commission, is chair of the American Bar Association Senior Lawyers Division. Elder Abuse Prevention Committee, and serves as Chair of the Policy and Procedure Subcommittee of the New York State Committee on Elder Justice. Prior to joining the Weinberg Center, she was Deputy Prosecuting Attorney in Oahu, Hawaii, uh, and Assistant Direct uh, District Attorney in the Queens County District Attorney's Office, where she focused on domestic violence cases. So I guess Oahu, Westchester, that's not something similar. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to welcome Deidre Locke as our first speaker this afternoon. Yeah. 
is for people, elder, some elderly people that can't speak for themselves or say they have dementia, or, you know, they could be definitely being abused and nobody would know about it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Where would they where would they go? Right. right? Um, yes. Well if it's found by the police or the authorities that there's um, abuse, I mean there should be immediately <coughs> Right. Where they go? Exactly. So when you think about where elder abuse takes place, where do where do you initially think of? Clinical setting. Home. Clinical setting. Yeah. Long term care facilities. Right. Um, I see some shaking of the head because, in fact, the major difference that I think there is between a long term care setting or clinical setting and the community is the oversight that happens in a long-term care facility, right? So you have um, all of the doctors and psychiatrists and physical therapists and medical personnel, along with your peers, along with additional staff who work in a long-term care facility. There's ombudsman, there's the Department of Health. There's a great deal of oversight. But when you think about the person who's in the community, and like um, this lady mentioned here, somebody in the community who may not be able to speak, um, who may have dementia and unable to be unable to report for themselves, what happens to them? What if something is happening to them? Um, where would they go? So in essence, um, this shelter model was created inside of a long-term care facility because the idea being that an older adult who's unsafe in the community needed a place beside the domestic violence shelter, which would not be appropriate for a woman who's 85 with dementia, or maybe a man who's 85 with dementia, or somebody who has certain physical impairments or any other kind of medical needs that can't be met in a DV shelter. Um, so thus, this is the creation of the Weinberg Center. Please feel free, just as an aside, to always know that you can use us as a resource if you ever feel that there's somebody that you're working with in whatever capacity um, in the community who is unsafe and they need to be placed in a long-term care facility, even temporarily, to get their medical needs met or any other kind of needs, you can always make a referral to us. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to go somewhat quickly. I have a lot of slides to cover, and I know I'm going to run out of time. Um, what is elder abuse? Without looking at the definition, um, but let me phrase it a different, uh, frame it differently. At what age does elder abuse begin? Anyway, shout out a number. 65. Hey, does anybody disagree? Well, what, what age? Uh, yeah, what age? Oh, what was the answer? What 65. She said? Oh. she said, yeah, she said 65. 50. Wow. So what was that? 50. 50. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Look, the point being, you know, there's there's silence, there's people not really sure what number to pick because that's just it. At what age does elder abuse begin? And that really just opens the door slightly to the obstacles uh, that exist when there isn't a real definition that everybody follows. And being that I'm an attorney and I like the law uh, most of the time, um, the you know, we really need to rely on guidelines or laws to dictate how we know when there is something that is either illegal or something that requires some level of reporting or intervention or whatnot. So it's really challenging because at what age does elder abuse begin? And what defines elder abuse? Um, there's not any statute in New York State that just clearly says, this is elder abuse across all gamuts. Um, that the definition that we at the Weinberg Center have chosen to really highlight is the CDC's latest definition. And this definition came from a study that they did in which they took a whole, they took a whole survey of elder abuse definitions um, and tried to come up with more or less one. But like I said, there's a whole study just about the definitions. Um, so it's an intentional act or failure to act by a caregiver or another person in a relationship involving an expectation of trust. And that's, I would highly that. That causes or creates a risk of harm to an older adult. Underneath all of what I'm going to speak about today, um, 
really lies the right to self-determination. So this goes to age, this goes to this, speaking about capacity or dementia, the right that every individual has to make bad choices um, is their right. And so I've made bad choices and have had bad judgment, as I'm sure each one of you have. Um, and that doesn't mean necessarily that something that somebody doesn't have that right to engage in any kind of behavior of their choosing. So for instance, real story here, my father is turning 75 this year. Um, and he has, yes, that's a younger woman. Um, he, she's 25 years younger than him, so just a little bit older than me. Um, and it's very interesting because they speak so much different languages. I don't speak her language. She doesn't speak English. Um, and my dad left upstate New York where I grew up my entire life. My dad worked for Decent Kodak, and he moved to California with her two summers ago. Um, and he's embarked on his whole other life. He has a stepson who's, I think, 14. Um, point being, one could say, I could say, Dad, what's going on here? But really, my dad is completely cognitively intact. And he has the right to make the decision to go live with, move wherever, engage with whomever he like. And in fact, when it comes down to also finances and money and things like that, if he were to ever decide that he wants to leave everything he might have, you know, whatever that is, to this woman and her family, as much as my sister and I might say, hey, it, it's his right. He can do whatever he'd like. Um, as long as it, it isn't rise to the level of him being incapacitated in any way and, you know, any other facts surrounding it that would lead to, you know, concern that there aren't any. This is really his choice. Um, so anyway, that just has to be touched upon when we start this conversation about elder abuse because elder abuse does sometimes have with it a paternalistic sense to it when you see somebody who's incapacitated who may be particularly vulnerable. Um, so, yes? Uh, just a question about the definition. It looks like this one includes what I would consider to be neglect. Is yeah. there a meaningful difference between abuse and neglect, or are they sort of under the same umbrella here? So, actually, this study defines each type of elder abuse, which we're also going to go through today. Um, Neglect is, you're right, neglect is a little bit of an outlier. There are three kinds of neglect, active, passive, and self-neglect. Um, and neglect can be abuse under the criminal statute in New York if you're a paid caregiver or you've been appointed by a court. Um, so the purpose of this definition, yes, would include neglect. Um, but it also, if you take a look at the study, I'm happy to share it also, if you take a look at the study, it has its own definitions of neglect. Okay. Um, this is my favorite part of the piece. Yes? This definition would also include uh, online or telephone scam taking away somebody's assets. Absolutely. Absolutely. It includes emotional abuse. It includes physical abuse. It includes um, abandonment. I mean, it, it, it is meant to be all the time. Um, okay, so this is, I debate always about what story to share because I think really talking about a particular case or story is the best way to bring home the idea of elder abuse and how it really will touch upon, I would suspect, each one of you in some way, shape, or form, whether personally or professionally. Um, so I'm going to tell my, the, my favorite story of uh, this woman, Irene. So she lived um, in the Lower East Side of Manhattan um, for most of her life. She was in her 80s. She had a small amount of income, Social Security, small pension. Um, she had two adult children, a boy and a girl. And the adult daughter had moved away, was living happily. She was an attorney, actually, in another state. Um, the adult son had also moved away. And Irene had stopped contact with him because 20-something years ago, he was addicted to alcohol, and he punched her. Um, and after that incident, she said, I'm not going to have anything to do with you. I don't want to talk to you anymore. And he was, as far as she, know, she knew, somewhere down south. 
Um, she was very able-bodied, she was very independent, and she was cognitively intact. Um, she did walk with a walker, she did have high blood pressure, um, but she cooked for herself, she went to the senior center, she bought groceries for herself, um, and she was happy at home. Out of the blue one day, her adult son reached out to her. And, you know, she, particularly because of her age, I think, was starting to really think about wanting a relationship again with him and wondering how he was doing and with hope that with the 20 years past that he would become healthier and um, she knew she had grandchildren that were his children that she wanted to see. And in fact, he says to her, I um, really would like to see you again, it's been, you know, decades, and I actually have lost my job and am getting a divorce and have nowhere to stay. Would it be okay if I came and stayed with you for a little bit? So Irene said, sure. Um, she hadn't seen him for so long and she, like I said, had hoped things were a lot better with him. So when he first came into her apartment, things were going really well. Uh, he slept on the couch for the first week or two. She was happy to hear how he was doing. It seemed like he wasn't drinking as much. Um, he wanted to go out and about every day looking for a job. A little time passed, um, and he started complaining about back pains because he had been in a car accident, he said. So sleeping on the couch was really bad for him, he said. So I gave him her bed, and he took her bed, and she took the couch thinking this was very temporary. Some more time passed, and he, she started to see evidence of that he was still drinking, and that he was a little bit irritable about certain things, like the food she cooked. He didn't like it. Um, and he would express that, particularly when he'd been drinking, and he would raise his voice. And increasingly, he would call her a name, um, he would tell her he hated her gross cooking. And he then started asking for money because he said he needed it because he couldn't stand her food and he needed to be able to eat. Increasingly, he asked for more money. Why? Well, he said he needed a metro card to go look for a job. Then he said he needed to buy a phone to look for a job. Then he needed to be able to buy a laptop to have access to print resumes to apply for jobs. He increased his demand for money more and more and more. And she never really saw anything that came of him, of her giving him money. But again, she was thinking, this is temporary, this is temporary. One night, he came home, and Irene had her friends come over. And her friends were all similar to her in age and some of them, one of them had a wheelchair, somebody else had a walker, somebody had a cane, a couple people didn't have anything. He came home and he was clearly drunk. He was very, very angry because all of these people were in his space. And he expressed his anger by picking up a plate, throwing it, and then taking Irene's walker and throwing it also basically across the room. I'm going to stop right there. What do you think happened? No, they killed her. Please. God, who said we killed her? I'm <laughs> <laughs> right there. <laughs> I mean, look, I will say, <laughs> who said that? Oh! <laughs> so, but well, he it, clearly was, you know, we knew what, what direction he was going. Well, yeah, and I will, you know, I will say that Elder abuse and domestic violence are clearly related, right? They, I'm going to go into some of the facts, but 90% of abusers in elder abuse cases are family members. And it's really a lot of adult children. But there's also DV that's grown old, there's new partners, um, and there is real overlap. And, you know, statistically, me having been a former DV, Prosecutor, but also I think it's becoming so much better known and, and um, there's changes in policy and laws around it, but domestic violence is the most dangerous kind of crime that police can respond to. When they get a 911 call and it's a DV 
me crying, those are among the most dangerous. Um, so, I, thank God, Irene was not killed. Um, and that's not how, that's not where this went. But to your point, in truth, these are very, very dangerous cases. And we are talking about people who um, have the propensity to be very violent. Um, so, that's all. What, what, what else could have happened to Irene? Or what, what do you think happened next? They're sitting around, they're having dinner. The son comes in, he now throws a couple of things. He's angry, he's drunk. If you're a friend of Irene's, what would you do? Call the police. Call the police. Okay, really think about that for a minute. If you're in this room right now and somebody did something like that, you'd call the police. Absolutely. Now, put yourself in the position of being 85. <coughs> in a wheelchair, in a small one-bedroom apartment, sitting around with your friends who are also not necessarily of physical statue and strength to fight against a six-foot-tall drunk man. And there's Irene, and that's her son, and you're right there with him. I mean, what, what are you going to do? Reach and, and grab yourself, you know, I mean, you could, and in some ways that would be great if you did, but that's not what our friends did. And I think we can call, all sort of understand why. Um, now, instead, what our friends did is they all left um, because they were scared. They were afraid. They didn't know what this guy was going to do, and they also felt like it's Irene's son. That's her choice and her home. And it's up to her. She saw it was her her walker. It was her plate. So not only do, do the friends leave, right? Do we think that Irene calls the police? No. no. God, I can't do this. Okay, say this a little bit. Um, okay, right. Irene does not call the police. And what would another what what is another consequence of this? Yes, isolation. Whoever said that? Because do you think the friends are coming back over? No. No, right? All right, I'm going to have to fast as much as I love Irene. I have to fast forward here. Um, one more point, though. The police, if the police were called to the person who said that they would call the police, let's say the police arrive, <coughs> what do you think happens then? Well, you know, the son can get arrested, right? Can they arrest him? Not if Irene says that nothing happened. <laughs> right. For what? What would they arrest him for, right? I mean, they didn't hit her or yeah. anything like that. He's so. right. He was aggressive towards her. They arrested him. his grounds for at least asking him to move out of the apartment on the green. Right. Yeah, but that, that presumes that Irene wants that. No, well, if she has to press charges. Yeah, so, but who here thinks that Irene's going to do no. that? Or Irene no, really no. wants that, right? That's not really, yes. Yeah, but if the police did arrive, that might mitigate some of the abuse. It might scare him slightly. It'll make it worse. Uh, yeah. If it's not her calling, and it was one of the friends calling, yes. he knew that. Yes. No, I mean, you know, yeah. I think that's an excellent point, that there is a difference between a person calling the police who's observed, in essence, a crime happen, versus the victim themselves calling the police. Right? They're, those are two very different voices. Um, and I, I think the outcome would potentially, could potentially be very different depending on who's calling. Um, however, because, you know, and I can think through what some of the crimes potentially could be, and if he could have been arrested, if he could, if he caused damage to the walker, um, and breaking the plate too, I mean, that's property of hers, that's, you know, arguably there could be some arrestable offense, but not without Irene being on board. Um, yeah. I hope she called her lovely daughter, who's the attorney. Uh, well, okay, so let's go there for a minute. Who here thinks she would reach out to her lovely daughter? If they're up. No, and you know why she doesn't? Because she doesn't, she, she her wants, daughters. her daughter's okay. She doesn't want to bother her daughter, right? She doesn't want to draw, pull her daughter into, the, and she keeps thinking, he's, he's, he's going to move out, he's going to get a job, and he's going to move out, so then, then that'll be good, right? Okay, so fast forward. Basically, then not only do the friends not come over, now her walker was damaged, right? So now her ability to get out and about 
also um, gets reduced. Her ability to go to the senior center, her ability to go buy groceries. And with that comes depression. With that comes isolation. Um, he continues to threaten her over time. He goes with her to uh, get her mail. He sees checks that arrive in the mail. He brings her to the bank teller. He stands with her at the bank teller where she has to cash the check, which she's never done. She always has savings. She always keeps most of it in the bank. Do you think the bank teller, who's known her for years, says anything, does anything? No. And what Irene does or what the son does that I think is so important to point out is that he stands next to her and he grips her elbow. So the bank teller doesn't see this. He, she sees him, she sees him supporting her, right? But what does that pinch, that slight grip do? What is that? It's a threat, right? It's intimidation, especially because he hit her before, right? Even those 20 years ago, that grip means I could do it again. I, you know, it's intimidation. So she passes, cashes the checks, she gives him the money, and it just progresses, and she gets more and more depressed. He threatens to take away her dentures, which then, what does that do? Now she's never going out, right? Now her food and her diet and her intake of nutrients change. She gets homebound. She starts to appear as if she's not as cognitively intact. Her senior center friends, long story short, end up calling, uh, the direct, speaking to the director there who calls Adult Protective Services, who then come and they see her. They thankfully look at her alone and they see that there's no good food in the refrigerator. They see that the place is a mess. They see that she's not able to articulate what's going on. She, um, th so they immediately bring her to a, a hospital. Um, and at the hospital, when she's hydrated and and she's gotten food and she's been taken care of, suddenly now she's able to speak and have conversations. And eventually, she moves into the Weinberg Center, into our shelter. Um, we helped to get an order of protection for her against the sun, and she was able to move back home. Um, so that's the long long story short. Uh, but I use Irene because when you, especially coming from a criminal background or a legal background, when you think about it, where, where's, where's the criminal, where's the breaking of the law? Where's, you know, something that can say, we would report this? There isn't really, it isn't really there. It's this cyclical power and control um, of abuse. Okay. What happened to the son? <coughs> He got out of the apartment. That was the name. Um, yeah, and she did not have contact with him. That's how how we left it. Um, which is also, I mean, that's a whole other issue, right? Is like severing contact for a woman with her son. She's 85 years old. Um, it's very very challenging. Okay, so a couple of studies to just take note of having to do with reporting and the under reporting of elder abuse. One in 24 cases are reported, which tells you that. 23 cases go unreported. Um, one in 44 cases of financial exploitation ever reach authorities. Um, the Truling study is excellent for showing the extent of financial abuse. Um, and the very last statistic about dementia and elder abuse really just is meant to highlight the vulnerability that a person with dementia has as a possible susceptibility to elder abuse. Okay, types of elder abuse. So you sort of mentioned physical abuse, emotional, psychological abuse, economic, financial exploitation, neglect. Does anybody know what kind of abuse here is missing? Sorry, say it again. What kind of abuse here is not me? Sexual. Yes, yeah. right. And in fact, older adults are sexually abused. Um, but in our, you know, we tend not to think about older adults as sexual beings, number one, um, and then number two, the fact that they also can be victims um, to sexual abuse is, the, some of the statistics are actually quite shocking as to how high um, that can be. <laughs> okay, so what is physical abuse? I'm not going to go too much in depth into this other than to, thank you, other than to highlight a study um, 
about bruising that, so the big takeaway that I'm going to ask each of you to um, take from this is no matter what in what capacity you are working um, or teaching or, um, you know, whether in, in your personal or professional life, ask the questions. You know, it's very difficult. We talk to attorneys all the time. No attorney ever wants to be like, so where'd you get that bruise from? Because you, you don't feel like it's your job. You don't, you don't feel comfortable with it. Nobody in law school talks to you about how to ask that question or whether or not you should ask that question. And what I'm suggesting to you is that you should. Um, even if it's uncomfortable, because you never know what somebody might be willing to share with you. You never know what may be going on for them at home. This study, um, I love because it, uh, Dr. Mosqueda had two groups of people, one group that had dementia and another group that did not. Um, one group also had bruising as a result of accidents and another group had bruising as a result of intentional infliction. Whether or not a person had dementia, something like 90 something percent of them could remember where they got their bruise from when it was intentional inflection, irrespective of whether or not they had dementia, versus the group of people who could not, most of them could not remember where they got the bruises from when there were accidents, when there was as a result of an accident, which makes so much sense to me. I mean, I have, I, I have bruises, and I can't, I'm a little clumsy. I don't know where I, exactly I got them from, but you better believe if somebody punched me, I'm going to remember that impacted where that injury came. Um, and the study is so interesting because it really demonstrates that it doesn't, that dementia shouldn't stop you from asking the question if you're working with somebody who has some cognitive impairment. Um, okay, the thing here that I also want to just point out is that how many, how many people think that other states have mandatory reporting? Yes. How, how many other states do you think are mandatory reporting? All of them, but New York, um, which I say it and make credit to it for the effect because it's, it is rather like, wait a minute, we're a great state. We should be on top on, on, on top of it. How come everybody else does something like that and we don't? It's actually probably for good reason, and there has been a lot of legislation that's been proposed. Um, but it goes back a little bit to the right to self-determination and money. So again, at what age would you report elder abuse? Under what circumstances? To whom? What would the response be? Those are all very challenging questions. And it's the reason why, in many respects, legislation in New York has not passed. And in fact, in many states where there is mandatory reporting, it's not very effective. Um, so it's, it's, it's controversial, but you know, it feels like we should have something. Um, these are just different criminal charges um, that go to the age difference. Um, there's no elder abuse criminal statute. Okay, emotional abuse. These are some examples of uh, different kinds of emotional abuse. Um, but I want to jump to the very last point of why wouldn't a victim report? Same reason all victims don't report their Housing, their yeah. money, yeah. their... Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna... You're right. I'm gonna paint a picture, though, of a younger person and an older person, okay? So let's say we have a 25-year-old woman who is, I just go with a you know, male partner, they have a child in common, they live together, she's financially dependent on him, and he hits her, and she falls down. What do you think happens? Well, okay, what would you do? Well, well, some people don't report it because, they, especially if she's financially dependent on this yep. person, um, no, she will not report it because right. she is, you know, she'll just be abused more. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. most women don't leave their abusive situation because, mm -hmm. especially if they're financially dependent on the person. Right. Yeah. So, you're, you're right. They're, the financial dependence, the child in common, uh, the shared living arrangement. But think about for that woman who's now on the 
ground. She can get back up. Right. Right? Some of us might punch back. Some of us might go to the telephone and call the police. Some of us might exit and go to a neighbor's. An older adult, let's take Irene, you know, when she's depressed and not really as coherent. Imagine if her son had punched her, what would happen? She'd fall on the floor. Can she get back up? I don't know. When, and we've had cases where people, usually adult children, have done something to an older adult and they <coughs> land, we have, a, we have a case right now where somebody was uh, pushed out of the wheelchair. She's also obese, left on the ground over 24 hours. Can't get back up. How is she gonna move? Is she gonna go to the police? Is she gonna be able to get to a phone? What if she has dementia? What if she's not coherent? What if she breaks a hip? And now she has to go to the hospital and get hip surgery and then go to rehab and can't walk. I mean, it's, it's so, when you're talking about an older adult, um, it is that much more complicated. Can that older adult go out, take your 25-year-old woman again, right? She's financially dependent, but she could possibly get benefits. She could possibly get a job. She could possibly get more education to get a job, right? An 85-year-old woman, she, is her income increasing? Does she even have a chance of her income increasing? Can she get a job? Can she sever the financial dependency? Likely not, right? Same with the shared living. Okay. And along with, going back to my point, you know, why would it affect the report? Adding to that image, you know, think about language barriers, think about cultural barriers, think about shame of it being, let's say, an adult child of yours and a sense of responsibility that you might have to that person. Very complicated. Um, okay, sexual abuse, these are some examples of sexual abuse. The point I'd like to make here when it comes to an older adult is really whether or not, for instance, let's take that 25-year-old woman again, and she goes into a hospital, and let's say she's, it's a you know tragic, traumatizing situation, but let's say that we, the hospital staff believes that she may have been raped, and let's say she is comatose at the moment. Do we think a rape kit would be done? Yes. Imagine it's an older adult with dementia. Is a rape kit going to be done? Probably not. Um, and that's, I mean, again, that's like, you know, we can argue different sides there, but it's just an interesting point to think about when you think about age is something, the difference in age. Um, neglect. So this touches upon a little bit of what I mentioned earlier, just the three kinds of neglect. Um, I don't need to say, I don't think I need to say much about it, except that there's active and passive. Passive when it is basically when it's not intentional, when you're not intentionally depriving somebody of um, assistive devices and other things that they may need. Active and less, uh, I guess, you know, the point I'd like to make here really is that let's take the situation of Irene and her son. Is there any reason why her son should be taking care of Irene? Does he have any legal obligations to take care of Irene? No, right? So as much as we may feel, like how can he let, let's say he didn't actively do anything to his mother, but let's say there's no food in the home and her walker's broken and he's not helping her. We can all say that's terrible, but there's no obligation, right? Um, so it's, it's, that becomes also complicated when it comes to the laws. Okay. Types of neglect. Um, follow your instincts with these when somebody is not, doesn't appear um, to be healthy, doesn't appear to be dressed appropriately, doesn't have the kind of assistive devices they need. Hearing, a lot of times people cannot hear. Um, and then you may be mistaken for some kind of cognitive impairment, but really they just can't hear. Um, and that's not necessarily neglect, but these are things to just pay attention to. Okay, financial abuse. This is a big one, um, going to the point you the gentleman made before about scams. I mean, we saw it in the financial abuse statistic. Financial abuse is rampant. And the, uh, in almost all of the cases we take into our shelter, there's a, set, there's a little scintilla of financial abuse tied to each of them, if not a large um, piece tied to them. The thing that I can say about financial abuse is that as one ages your brain, they've now done studies where it 
indicates that your brain, some of the first parts of your brain that may deteriorate and it is part of the natural aging process is um, one, the area of your brain that tells you about your gut or your instinct or your reaction to like faces. And a person who started to have this part of their brain deteriorate doesn't necessarily know to identify red flags of a perpetrator in the same way that somebody who has an entirely healthy brain would. Um, and numbers. Um, they become very difficult to manage and um, it's important to pay attention to all of the different kinds of red flags and financial abuse because it can wipe out somebody's entire savings and their home and everything else. Um, these are the red flags of financial abuse. Things to remember while interviewing, this is just the idea that when you're working with an older adult, there are certain cues that you should keep in mind. Um, and we really believe in screening for elder abuse and asking those questions. Legal remedies can include getting orders of protection in family court and criminal court, getting restraining orders. There's also civil remedies. Um, guardianship is a whole area having to do with lack of capacity or cognitive impairment. Um, and it has to be balanced against somebody's right to self-determination. Um, so they're complicated legal remedies, but there are, they do exist. This is an example of an elder abuse screening tool. If anybody would like a copy of it, let me know, because we really do encourage asking questions. Um, and we're working with the courts right now to get um, self-screening elder abuse, and we've worked with a lot of different legal and social service agencies to try and encourage asking of these kinds of questions. Um, multidisciplinary, I didn't even touch on this, um, and it's so relevant, but the idea is that every single profession really can touch elder abuse and can touch an older adult. So the fact that as a lawyer, I can remedy everything for an older adult is completely um, misguided. I need the help of a doctor or social worker or a nurse to cover some medical pieces. I would perhaps need law enforcement to help enforce it. It is a multidisciplinary effort that is really needed to address elder abuse. These are just some of the different resources we use. Um, getting eyes and ears into the home if you have any suspicion of anything is really the strongest suggestion we can make. And these are some of the federal, more federal resources, uh, city meals and meals and public crises. Um, but you'd be surprised if the US Post Office, they have a great team to address health reviews and you wouldn't necessarily think it. Um, scan prevention materials, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has excellent materials if anybody wants them, they're free and they mail them to you. They're really good financial abuse stuff. And I will leave you with this quote because as I stated before, my suggestion, my hope is really that you walk away from this knowing that just asking an older adult the question would really open the door to seeing what's going on for them inside their home and perhaps intervene or prevent elder abuse. Question, please. Sure. Because the video's not catching it. Okay. So, As yes. an attorney, how would you suggest we uh, prevent scams for the elderly? Um, knowledge, education, really, because um, where I see financial abuse and <coughs> scams happen the most is with an older adult who is um, isolated at home, there are a lot of telephone scams and we have had countless number of people who are lonely and get and become befriended by people who call them 
and eventually ask for money. Um, that and all of the, the, the IRS scams and the Medicaid card scams, I mean, it's really about knowledge, knowing. Don't ever give your social security number to somebody over the phone. You know, don't give away information to somebody when you don't know who they are when they've called you. you if you're calling them, that's one thing. But if you're receiving the call, um, and nobody's giving away free money. Uh, it just doesn't, you know, it's just not happening. So education, really, and, and combating isolation, I think, are the two suggestions, although both of those are not exactly legal. but um, that's That suggests that we allow all of the scammers to continue, and we just prevent the, the scam by arming the elderly with knowledge and their relatives with knowledge. Isn't there some way to do more than that? Yes, and that, you, it, and there's great, so so this gentleman's point, I'm supposed to repeat, this gentleman's point was, isn't there, you know, why is the onus on the, on the older adult to get educated about the scams? In fact, why isn't, why aren't we going after the scammers themselves? Um, and in fact, I, that is a frustration actually felt all around, including by law enforcement, because as you might know, many of the scammers are international, and so, Law enforcement internationally, I mean, it's not your local precinct or your local police department that feels empowered. Um, the best advice I have is, I recently heard somebody from, well, about a year ago, from somebody from the Department of Justice talking about how they are um, going after people internationally with some success. So the idea really legally would be for a person to report it. And the Office of Victim Services has recently raised the amount that they're willing to reimburse an older adult. It's up to, I believe, $30,000. So report it. Even if it doesn't feel like somebody's going to address it or is in, you know, going to do something, in fact, law enforcement is. And there may be a financial benefit to you to report us. We have time for one more question, Dr. Lee. Hi. Um, I was just curious about the shelter. Um, what's the geographic uh, area that you serve? How many people do you see in the course of the year? And how long do they stay with you? Um, so the shelter serves all of all five boroughs and Westchester. Um, we take in anybody regardless of their ability to pay. They can come in. Um, we're, this is the multidisciplinary team effect on it because the way it works is you call 1-800-56-SENIOR. You go through our admissions department. That it, then the admissions department takes a little bit of information, and then one of our team members gets notified. So that includes myself, a senior staff attorney, another attorney. We have a senior social worker, a public health specialist, a, a case manager. So any one of us knows how to respond. We then get as much information as we can about the person medically, his, you know, what the alleged elder abuse might be, what community contacts might be. We do a little bit of investigation and then come to a determination about whether or not we think it would be a good admission for the person. Um, and then the person can come in and they can stay really for however long they'd like to. Um, the idea always is to get somebody back home. I mean, we are completely on board with people should stay in their homes and that's where we'd like to see them go and our legal <coughs> remedies often are so that the person can go home. However, many older adults who are victims also have capacity issues and so it's not always possible for somebody to go home. And if they have the medical needs, they can stay long term at the Hebrew home if that's the choice either themselves or a guardian would make for them, or any other long term care facility. Um, does that answer your question? Thank you. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, Deidre, thank you for a very engaging and stimulating presentation, a large range of issues open up new eyes in terms of probably the fighting number of use many there. We're going to take about a five minute parade so you can stand vertical in the uh, that city position and go to the restroom if you want to come back quickly. We want to get back relatively soon so if you can take a real quick up and down. We'll start uh, in about five minutes for the next one.